there are so many different roadblocks um, that you can run into when you intervene with children. Um, there are some really common roadblocks. We'll talk about those really vis-a-vis -vis the kids we've seen, which are children who are fairly impacted in terms of their developmental <coughs> level um, right now. Um, but you always have roadblocks. And if you're working um, as a therapist, you will deal with those. But even if you're working with, through a parent, you want to make sure that everything isn't always perfect. <laughs> not, that, not that things ever are really perfect. But you want to actually deal with some of the roadblocks. So if you have a toy that they're obsessed with, and the parent is having a lot of difficulty, but the child has access to that toy. You want to actually deal with that. You might not deal with it in the very beginning, but as the, over the course of your intervention, you're going to want to bring that toy back in. Um, another roadblock is just the disinterest in toys. For most of the kids that we see with autism, they are going to be um, beyond infancy for most of us. So they're going to be uh, probably the youngest two, right? three, four. Children at that age that are neurotypical are interested in toys. Um, children play with toys. So for us, um, that's why this, this um, intervention really focuses on play with people and play with toys. But you can have children who are really disinterested in toys. Um, and so they may be either developmentally very young, um, like our first child, so people games are going to be very important. That's what children do. They play baby games with adults. Um, we can bring in an object with a puppet, right? And so that you can get that shifting between object and person. Um, we can get a song that matches a toy, sort of wheels on the bus and have a bus. So there are ways of bringing in objects. Um, but there are times where you're just going to want to do people games. And it's a break for the ch uh, child. It may be a big reinforcer. And then you can transition back and forth between people games and people object games. You have children that are very hypersensory, and we have seen a couple of children um, in this workshop who are very, um, they're sensory seeking, right? Um, they're avoidant, which are, these are different things, so hyposensory and hypersensory. Uh, um, in the case that we saw with the second child, a very visual child, and we have children who um, are visual learners, but this, this is getting in his way to some extent. Um, and so you want to, again, try to develop some of the person engagement activities that aren't demanding. I think your suggestion earlier was an excellent one, where if the person is putting demands on the, the child, person engagement may, may not be a reinforcer. So we want to try to develop singing, although second child also cried when you sang and it's unclear if you weren't singing very well <laughs> you didn't like the game or you know you were you were certainly interrupting something for him so it's something to think about um, you can bring in sensory activities to try to get engagement and again there's this fine line between using things like water and beans and play-doh textures. You, you know, there's a fine line and you have to determine as a therapist, is that creating more of an object-focused, unengaged feeling to the engagement or is it helping you facilitate the sort of joint engagement? So again, these are things to try. Um, tac tactile, so different textured blocks would be an example. If they like the texture, that's great, but if they get too overly focused, you might want to change up the texture of the blocks. Other ones um, are the child who's very, very rigid in their play. And so you want to wait and watch what happens first, always. You want to assess your play environment for um, you know, things that might be either inhibiting or um, maybe a factor in the rigidity problem. Um, you could use a verbal prompt. You could try that. Um, you could model a different play action. You could try a different model. You could go back to person engagement. Um, and as a last resort, you're going to remove that toy. Right? But again, as therapy goes on, you're going to want to bring that toy back in. And we've done this over and over again, and we're usually pretty successful. So if they're obsessed with books and flipping the pages of the book, and you can't get the book away, we would probably ignore that the book is there, and we would try to get them engaged in some other activity. 
um, and then eventually the book might go away. With our little guy that we had the first day that held on to the blue fork, we might um, just ignore that blue fork and again try an activity and try not to take it away because he tantrumed when that happened. So again, you know, we would try to either bring in similar materials and see if we get something going or some other routine. So again, we don't want kids in tantrums. Uh, we also don't want to give in to behavioral issues. So then, you know, it's this fine line. And you're going to use your behavioral strategies along with your developmentally appropriate um, targets. Okay, let's talk about parent coaching. So again, we talked about how we, when we train people in the lab, we train them like we would train our parents. We go through a module at a time, which we don't have the opportunity to do in a workshop. And we're fairly limited in the modules we can use with the children that uh, were selected for us to work with. So we're kind of at sort of, I mean, it's, they're interesting children in that we're at the very basic level of Jasper. And we're also dealing with a lot of roadblocks. So, you know, I think it's really good information. But what you don't see is sort of a progression of, of the intervention. So when we're working with parents, the therapist knows all of the, um, the modules and they know all the strategies. So we would present the module content to the caregiver, we give them a handout. And we try to talk to them in the moment for a minute or two. And we give them the handout so that they can review it later. So it's basically little sound bites because you don't want to lose the child. So if we talk too much, you've lost the child. So, you know, some kids you can talk more and it's okay, and some you can't talk much at all. Um, so you want to teach that specific module content, and you're going to provide them with the overview of the module, explanations of the content while you're playing, and then a summary of that content um, at the end. The level of support that you give the caregiver requires um, some reflection of the parent. So you let the parent kind of use the strategies that they have because a lot of parents come in with really great strategies. They work for them. You let them sort of show you, you know, you let them kind of reflect on what this module is and how I'm going to handle it. Um, then you would jump in first with a verbal suggestion and then a model if you need to. Now there are parents that need a lot more support. We've had parents say, I, I can't engage them. I, I just need someone to show me. And it's okay for you to actually do more of the, the intervention and sort of back the parent in. There are other parents that are very comfortable just doing it all. And so you just want to respect what the parent is needing and what they're asking from you. So the weekly parent modules, which are in your book, um, so we start off by talking about, um, well, this, these are the 10. I think we'll go through these. So we talk about engagement states and play levels. So we basically are giving them feedback on where their kid is developmentally. So, you know, we would say um, about the, in, we would talk about the engagement states. We'd make sure that they understand where their child is mostly playing. If their child is mostly object engaged, whether their child is in a supported joint engagement uh, state already. And we would talk about how we want to get to coordinated joint engagement, but we also would pinpoint where we're starting with that child. Then we would talk about where their child is in terms of play level. So that's why we spent the first day going over the assessments that we use. I think you can use any assessments um, they could even be more naturalistic assessments with some probes, just so that you have the information, you feel pretty confident that you know the play level. And the play levels are very detailed. We've put, we've chunked them for parents into, you know, simple play, combinations, pre-symbolic and symbolic, because it's just easier to understand. But we really think about the detail of those levels of play, because we're going to target, you know, a presentation combination or a general combination, they're all combination play. But a child may be at a particular level that we want to really target in our therapy. And we might, we'll, we'll always have another play level or two above and below, depending on what the child needs. 
because remember the goal is engagement and so we don't want to lose that as sort of the main goal. So um, after that we're going to talk about setting up the environment and so there are um, a lot of steps that we'll talk to the parent about so we want them to face the child, uh, we want to remove distractions, we want to notice um, you know where the child is looking so what their attentional focus is. We we'll want to set up the room and we want to know their child, right? So we want to know the play level, we want to know what the joint attention target is, what kind of activities are motivating and so on. Following the child's lead, again we're waiting for a moment to see what the child does. We then follow, we, um, if we don't get much we're going to offer a choice, right? Do you want the blue block? or the doll, or you know, whatever it might be, that would be a, an appropriate choice. Uh, we don't try to do that too often, right? Because by doing that, you're forcing a choice, which is meaning that the child is, you're following a lead, but you've completely structured it. Um, it's, the child is responding, you're following it. It's not exactly following the child's lead. It's kind of a last resort. Um, and then the next one is establishing routines. Um, so that's a lot of what we've done, is we've tried to think about appropriate toy choice for the children that we've seen. We've tried to just try to establish a little routine. And, and both of these children, um, one of them is at simple play, one of them is at combination play. And there's a lot of different, um, you know, uh, suggestions for how we might um, set up that routine which we talked about yesterday. Um, again, this balance between imitating and modeling. So we really want, we, we tend to take a very low-key approach in the beginning, try to get the parent to imitate a lot more because it's too easy to fall into being, to model and being very directive and prompting because that's often what um, parents are taught. So we want to be careful that we kind of back off a little bit. We can always add those in as needed. Um, we then talk about sort of building these everyday routines. So adding new steps, having little surprise elements, right? Because if you can, once you have the routine established, you change something up, it's kind of a surprise and a lot of times children will look at you just naturally and you'll get more of that sort of reciprocity going. So we try to build in those surprises pretty soon after we've got that uh, routine established. We want to be really excited. Remember this is play and so it's supposed to be fun. That's what children do. They play. They have fun. And so we're trying to actually model that. Um, and then we of course are making eye contact with the child. We've already talked about recruiting eye contact where we don't want to do a lot of that. But of course, we're, we're scaffolding, we're setting up the environment because of course we want the child to look at us. Uh, we just don't want to put a demand on them to do that. Not, not with play. Um, you know, as the intervention goes on, now we're into phase two. So we think about this in phases, right? So phase one is kind of the basics. Phase two, we start adding in some of these skills. And that's something we learned from our research, that in fact doing um, discrete targets of joint attention is not where we should start. That they're going to do more of that if they've got an established routine going and some engagement. So then we really explain what joint attention is and how to model it. Um, we give them some suggestions for encouraging more communication, so things like don't feel like you need to talk all the time, right? That talking less actually gets your child to talk more. But you have to be strategic about it. You have to have a, voca a target vocabulary. You want to mirror and map those words if you can. So you would imitate what the child says, then you would add another word or two. And you want to be talking about the kinds of things that, that you're playing with. Um, and so actually talking about the right kind of words. So we try to clean up the language towards the end of our intervention, which is usually somewhere between 10 and 12 weeks. And the reason for that is it's just a lot to keep in your head. If you're worried too much about what you're saying, you can't focus on the engagement as much. 
So we don't want parents to be too um, conscious about what they're saying. And we model as therapists language that's kind of uh, targeted and we talk less and so we're modeling all the time before we even teach this module. Some parents just will naturally pick up on that and actually that's one of the things we're looking at in our research is how much are parents picking up on just our modeling um, or you know we usually think of parents getting um, at high fidelity at the end of the treatment. So we're only really checking fidelity on the things that we've taught. But we're also looking at things we haven't taught to see what comes along naturally. And for some parents, a lot of this comes along naturally, especially when the child is very responsive. It's a lot easier. Um, and then it's harder with some children, and then some parents um, just learn better once it's been taught.